Welcome to this CraterConf 2017 video. A big thank you to all the speakers that uh, took time to give these talks. Hopefully you enjoy this video series. Uh, and also be on the lookout. You can go to crater.io to get uh, all the latest JavaScript news. And you can uh, also follow me on Twitter, at Josh Owens. And uh, we've got some other exciting stuff coming up in 2017. Thanks. Enjoy the video. We have David Wells with us. He's going to talk about serverless. Uh, you actually work for serverless, don't you, David? I do indeed. But uh, what I'm talking about today is kind of the overall picture of, of what's out there with serverless, not necessarily like what our company does. Yeah. I actually saw, I got to see two um, demos. I ran a conference um, in uh, North Carolina. Gosh, what's the name of that place? Um, like off the coast there anyway not important but like i saw two demos at that that thing back to back and like it just it amazed me how easy it was to like deploy things and get everything hooked up and everything was just like working together and they were uh i think they were using bd a little bit as well and doing like real time updating it it, it, it was super slick so i just knew nice we uh we had to have someone talk about serverless and uh you were the guy so yeah for sure take mm -hmm. it away Glad to be here. All right, cool. So let's talk about building serverless applications with Node.js. Um, and a, a little bit about myself. I'm a full stack developer in San Francisco, uh, working at a startup called Serverless. You can check us out at serverless.com. Uh, but what I'm talking about today is more about just the idea of what serverless is and how uh, developers can leverage that to uh, build uh, and scale out applications kind of in a way that, that we haven't been able to do uh, before without a, a lot of uh, developer operations and what have you. Um, so the quick agenda of this uh, presentation, we're gonna jump into what exactly serverless architectures are. Um, it's kind of a confusing term to some, so I'll uh, dispel all those things. Uh, we'll talk about some use cases uh, and some real world examples. And then I'm going to show a couple of demos uh, and then we'll jump into Q&A at the end. Um, but cool, so let's get started. So server what? Serverless, what is this thing that you speak of? Um, of course there's servers at the end of the day, um, but really what we're talking about is uh, how developers can use this new technology um, without having to deal with a lot of the previous things that uh, you had to do with uh, maintaining and scaling your own servers. Uh, and serverless seems like it's all the rage these days in terms of the buzzword that you'll see all over Hacker News and Twitter and what have you. Uh, but let's dive into exactly kind of what it means. So uh, to me, serverless is really uh, these things, serverless is, is basically a new approach at building uh, and scaling out your applications, like I mentioned. Um, so your servers, uh, while you don't actually touch them ever, uh, they auto-scale for you. Um, there's this concept of everything's event-driven or push-based. So instead of pulling for data um, or having uh, machines kind of sitting there idly, um, everything's event-based. So if a new user signs up, to your service, that triggers an event that then triggers you know, the welcome email, for example. And we'll look into some use cases of that in the future here. Um, you also never pay for idle machines. So I can't tell you how many side projects I've had uh, in the past where I was running on you know, a digital ocean uh, droplet or on Heroku where you know, it was really just me and maybe my mom and some other users using it. Uh, but I'm paying monthly for that. So it was started to basically add up. The costs add up when your machines are running uh, and really not being used. And most applications kind of fall into this category. Um, and yeah, so basically that's kind of one of the paradigms of serverless. Like when you're using AWS Lambda, or we'll talk about some of the other providers as well, um, you only pay for what you use uh, by the millisecond usage. Um, which is amazing and kind of was the light bulb that got me kind of into this space. Um, the other, the other thing is like the systems are implicitly fault tolerant. So, 
uh, if let's say that you launch your application and you get on the front page of Hacker News, you're on the front page of Reddit, you're for whatever reason, the New York Times picks you up and puts you on the front page. Um, you don't need to worry about scaling out your servers. You don't need to uh, worry about uh, basically downtime uh, with that huge rush of, of traffic. Uh, the actual provider under the hood, AWS, Google, or IBM, or Microsoft, there's a ton of them out there. Um, they'll actually uh, scale out those servers for you. So it's kind of like auto scaling on steroids, uh, where you really don't have to uh, you know, scale up dynos or do anything yourself. Uh, it'll just do that out of the box for you. Uh, and the other kind of uh, idea here is that uh, you, you want to break up your application into smaller pieces. It's really taking a microservices approach um, to how you build your application. So instead of building a, a really large monolithic uh, application with all the bits and pieces in there where you have to deploy it all at once, um, it's really about breaking out your application into tinier pieces so you can uh, deploy them individually and they can scale individually as well. Um, and then there's also this notion of offloading uh, things that aren't your core business competencies to third-party services. Um, and that's, for example, like if, you know, re-rolling like user auth for every application doesn't really make sense or writing your own email uh, sending server uh, to send transactional emails doesn't make sense because there's these amazing third-party services out there um, like Mailgun or Auth0 that do all that for you and do it extremely well. So you can kind of focus on your actual application um, rather than, uh, you know, building out those the kind of glue glueware, if you will. So, and this is, this is the, the one thing that people get hung up on is like, there's no servers. Of course, at the end of the day, there are servers. Um, the difference, however, is that you no longer have to maintain, patch, upgrade, or uh, scale these yourself. Um, all that stuff is kind of abstracted away from you. Um, and kind of the, whenever I get a tweet <laughs> like this, or uh, asked at a conference, you know, there's clearly servers. Uh, yes, uh, I explain, you know, why it's different. And then I also throw out, you know, yeah, think about your wireless router for your, you know, your Wi-Fi. Is it truly wireless? Like it may, it is to you, it, the, the wires are abstracted away from you, but at the end of the day, there's a router in your house somewhere that's connected to a wire. So that's kind of the, the quick tidbit I like to give about that. Um, and, uh, so running like serverless architectures, um, like server, like our company serverless, we actually, all we have is a, uh, we have an open source, uh, framework to let you deploy, uh, your applications. That's really it. We, we're not a hosting provider. Um, we really, uh, plug into the main providers out there. Um, and these are some of them. So we have AWS Lambda. Uh, this is uh, the Amazon Web Services answer for their compute layer. Um, IBM OpenWhisk, Google Cloud Functions, and Microsoft uh, Azure Functions. Um, and really, like the, the biggest player out there right now is dev by far uh, AWS Lambda. Um, I'd say they'd have like around like 80% market share somewhere on that. Um, but the other ones uh, quickly are building out their offerings. And um, it is, yeah, it's basically like the competition's heating up and it's, it's pretty cool to see all of it. Uh, like basically the, the four biggest tech companies um, offering these services um, and seeing kind of the value in this uh, serverless event-driven paradigm. Um, and a question I get asked a lot is like, how are these different? Um, they're different, uh, they have different ways that you write your functions. Uh, there's slight differences between them. Uh, another difference is the runtimes that are supported. Uh, obviously this is a JavaScript focused conference. Um, I believe, yeah, all of them support Node.js, um, but uh, for example, I believe Azure Function supports uh, PHP and some other languages that AWS Lambda doesn't support. Right now, AWS Slam that does Python, Node.js, and uh, Java. Um, another difference uh, would be with IBM OpenWhisk. 
it's completely open source, so you can actually see uh, how uh, it's implemented and actually deploy that on your own infrastructure. So if you wanted to uh, run an on-premises version uh, of a you know compute layer like this, functions as a service layer, uh, you could do that. Uh, and another kind of honorable mention here is uh, webtask.io from Auth0. So it's a uh, Kind of a bare bones uh, function uh, tool, but it's uh, basically you can run kind of functions on demand as well. Um, but cool. And as a side note, we just added support for IBM OpenWhisk in the serverless framework. Uh, we've been primarily some supporting AWS because it's you know the largest market share, but we're uh, working on adding in all of these providers to uh, the framework. So how did we how did we get here? How did how did serverless come about? Uh, how did this functions as a service offerings from all these different uh, you know huge tech and tech companies come to be? Um, and really, it goes back to the history of how we built and deployed applications. Um, you know, way back in the day, you would have to uh, if you were running an application at scale, you'd have to go you'd have to build a data center. Um, and you know, have a whole team, you know, building the hardware, building and maintaining that data center. Um, then we kind of uh, evolved from that into a cloud computing kind of world, where uh, we started with virtual machines. So instead of actually maintaining and building your own data centers, you would you know run, rent space and run virtual machines uh, on their boxes that kind of evolved into what we see with things like Heroku and the platform as a service uh, movement, where instead of you know, having to deal with that, those lower level uh, pieces, um, they kind of give you a platform to just deploy your application to. Uh, and that, uh, then the inevitable conclusion is uh, the serverless space, where it's really just functions running on demand, uh, where you're not paying for any of that idle time. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's really interesting to see, uh, how, uh, all these things kind of evolved, um, and how all of these different levels of abstraction build upon each other. Uh, but yeah, so what, so like some of the like main principles of a serverless uh, architecture, and this is taken from a pre presentation from, uh, Sam Kroonberg and Peter Sbarsky of A Cloud Guru. If you haven't checked out A Cloud Guru, I highly recommend it. If you're trying to learn uh, any of the providers like AWS or Google Cloud, uh, et cetera, they have a, a ton of amazing training videos. Um, that's actually, as a side note, that's actually one of the hardest parts of getting started with the serverless kind of ecosystem is learning AWS or learning Google Cloud functions, uh, et cetera. So highly recommend that uh, and checking out this uh, presentation that they gave. Um, but cool. So um, basically, the principles we want we need to use a functions as a service um, compute on demand layer. So our our code we're deploying it up as functions. It's running on demand when it's called uh, by our application. Um, everything's a single purpose stateless function. So again, this kind of microservices uh, approach. Um, it is uh, everything's push based. Um, and event driven. So based off events that are happening in your system, uh, things are happening and we'll see some examples of that in a second here. Um, and then it also has this notion of creating thicker, more powerful front ends. So uh, the browser is getting more and more advanced uh, and I'm sure you know all the JavaScript developers listening know that uh, with you know React and a bunch of the other front end frameworks. It's really, uh, it's really getting cool what you can do on the front end, and I'm going to show you an example of that as well. Um, and then the, that notion that I mentioned before, embracing third-party services, so offloading uh, those core concerns that, that or offloading the concerns that aren't core to your business uh, or your core business competencies, the value that you're delivering to your users like authentication or sending text messages or emails or you know you name it there's probably a third party service out there that you can uh, leverage instead of uh, rolling your own cool so 
let's jump into some use cases. Um, and then we'll jump into some actual code examples. So the use cases of serverless, everything. All right, presentation over. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Uh, there is an asterisk there. Uh, there are some limitations that we'll jump into. Uh, but let's look at some of the examples of really what we can do, some of the use cases. Um, I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time on this slide because there's a lot to run through. Okay, so um, first things first, uh, one of the biggest kind of use cases that we see is using it for web and mobile backends. So if you uh, are creating express applications uh, in Node.js, um, uh, you're familiar with like kind of the request response model. Um, really what you can do, and there's actually a project out there, Express Lambda, I believe it's called from AWS, that you can, you can port over your existing Express application, uh, uh, chop it into functions, and deploy the, that to AWS Lambda, and then you're only paying for the actual invocations of those API endpoints, and you get that raw scale out of the box. Um, and so, so really, and, and you can use the entire power of the NPM ecosystem to, um, you know, build whatever functions that you want. So exactly like you would be building on an, uh, you know, in Express, for example, you could do that um, with a, f a function that you deploy up to Lambda. Um, yeah. So another uh, use case would be form processing, which is basically a backend API. Uh, we use that on our site. Uh, I'll show a demo of that in a little bit. Um, we also, uh, another use case is image processing. So um, you can basically uh, have a API endpoint set up listening for image uploads. And once an image gets uploaded and dropped into, let's say, an S3 bucket, S3 is simple uh, storage service from AWS. Uh, once a new profile image gets uploaded by the user, let's say that they uploaded an image that's way too large or would uh, be a performance burden if it, you know, someone saw it in the front end of the application, you could uh, automatically kind of listen to that. Uh, when a new image is added to a bucket, then you can uh, throw it into a Lambda function to resize it back to a you know, suitable size for the web or create a thumbnail of it. Uh, and then put it back into an S3 bucket. Um, and that's, again, all kind of event-driven. Um, and we have a, I have a diagram of that uh, in an upcoming slide here. Uh, another use case would be web scraping or testing. So one of the things that you can do with uh, Lambda is, as well with Node, is run binaries. So uh, you could basically run a binary of PhantomJS and do web scraping or run um, something like just through using the request module, request HTML web pages, um, use something like Cheerio to parse the HTML, and then return a response to you. Um, and by the way, uh, and this is getting into some of the other use cases here, it, everything doesn't have to be a, a request response with a Lambda, right? So uh, if you wanted to, for example, uh, mix and match some of these use cases here. You could basically set up a cron job in AWS Lambda to say, okay, every day go and scrape, you know, my favorite sports team's website uh, .com to see if there's any updates. If there are any updates, use the Twilio uh, SDK from NPM and, uh, you know, send me a text message of the updates. Um, but yeah, so it's really, you can kind of mix and match these together to do a lot of interesting things. Um, another use case would be serving di uh, HTML or dynamic binaries. Um, and what I mean by that is like, so when uh, someone hits your API gateway endpoint, you don't have to just return JSON um, for you know, an API to consume. You can actually return HTML. Uh, or image uh, files, any, any type of binary, or an SVG, et cetera. Um, so a use case of this would be um, if you're running a marketing campaign um, and your, your traffic is going to, and it's a dynamic uh, page, um, and you, like, basically you're expecting spiky, spiky traffic, 
Um, you could basically set that up behind an API gateway endpoint and return the dynamic HTML to the uh, visitor, and that would kind of scale for you out of the box. Um, another use case, um, and this is another example that I'll show you guys, is webhook listeners. So um, there are so many amazing uh, SaaS products out there um, and tools like GitHub that expose webhooks. So when something happens in GitHub, they, if you plug in a webhook listener, they will post an event out and let you know about it. Um, but before this kind of uh, compute on demand service was available, you would have to set up your own server and again, pay hourly for that server. Um, so doing um, really quick, simple applications uh, wasn't really, didn't really make sense from a cost perspective or a maintenance perspective. But now that's kind of gone by the wayside um, because your code only runs uh, when like the webhook fires, so you're not paying hourly for usage and um, you don't have to maintain the server or worry about kind of security risks and stuff uh, around that. Cool, and I already mentioned cron jobs, so uh, yeah, the, basically using cron syntax, you can run um, Lambda functions whenever you want. Uh, we have uh, a buddy uh, on our team here at Serverless is using it to remind him of when San Francisco street cleaning is. So like every third, every every second week, Thursday or something, it, he'll get a text message to uh, move his car, which is interesting. Uh, another use case would be DevOps or infra infrastructure automation. So um, you can listen to uh, AWS uh, infrastructure events. So if, for example, um, you have a team member spinning up a new server, like a new EC2 instance, um, if they are still using, you know, if you are still using servers, which there are some use cases <laughs> for that, which we'll get into. Um, but uh, basically, um, you could basically listen to that infrastructure event and then run, for example, a security audit to make sure that all of the uh, checks, uh, you know, everything's in place, so there's no security risks uh, exposed by that machine. And if there are, you could automatically spin that down with a Lambda function, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, so more infrastructure events, like I mentioned, S3. So if a new file is uploaded or a file is changed, um, that will f uh, fire events and Lambdas can listen to those and react to them like resizing images or uh, transcoding video files, um, you know, et cetera. Um, and then also there's a huge list of infrastructure events on the AWS website um, if you Google it. But another interesting one is, is the DynamoDB. Um, so if a new item is added to your database, um, basically a Lambda function can listen to that and then um, you can react to it. So like a really good use case, uh, something I was, it's not super trivial to do. Um, well, it's it's harder than needs to, to be to do. Uh, the old way um, would be if a new user signs up to your service, you want to uh, send an email. Usually you'd have to like batch that. Um, or if you're using a microservices approach, you'd have a uh, separate service to do that. Um, but with a DynamoDB um, event, you can just listen, hey, there's a new uh, user added to the user's database, send them the welcome email. Um, super straightforward, and uh, in my opinion, a little bit more logical to follow uh, when looking at uh, architecture of what's doing what, when things are being triggered by events. Um, and then, of course, you can set up Alexa skills, um, so you can say, hey, Alexa, when is my bus coming or whatever? Uh, set up your own custom to, uh, command to do whatever you want. Uh, IoT events, so if you're doing anything in the IoT space, um, you know, with Raspberry Pi or Arduino or what have you, um, there's a, you can uh, basically plug in there. And then bots as well. Bots is another uh, pretty big use case that we see. Um, so if you want to type in, you know, a specific command into, into Slack and have a Lambda function listen to that, um, you know, you could set up a bot to do that and uh, do custom things. 
Cool. So what serverless, what can't it do? It can't uh, run the processes longer than five minutes. So if you're doing some like uh, intense processing or, um, you know, data manipulation that takes longer than five minutes, um, Lambda uh, really isn't the answer for that right now. It's a limitation from AWS. I don't know if they're going to lift it or not. Um, that would be interesting to see. But um, there are some workarounds, however, to this. Um, you can, and this is, you want to be extremely careful when you're doing <laughs> this, but you can run recursive uh, Lambda calls. So you can have a Lambda function that calls itself until it's done doing what it needs to do with the data that's passing uh, from one call to another. Uh, you want to be careful with that because you can run into a, you know, infinite loop um, and see a nice bill in AWS Lambda. Um, but yeah, and another kind of uh, more sane workaround would be if you have a process running longer than five minutes, um, if it's triggered off by some sort of event, like a user clicks a button to say like, okay, uh, process my data or whatever uh, in the UI, you could use a, you could listen with a Lambda function. So uh, the Lambda function is listening. It hears the users requesting this long running process. That Lambda function then can spin up an EC2 instance or machine learning instance or whatever you're trying to do. That's like a really long running process. Um, do the job and then return uh, the data to the user. So there are some workarounds there, but that is one of the uh, limitations. Cool. So uh, let's look at some examples. So some examples um, of event-driven uh, applications. So this is a cool, <laughs> this is a fun one that was sent to me by uh, John McKim over at Acloud Guru. Um, he writes a lot of interesting posts on Medium as well. I recommend checking out. But this is a serverless app that, um, you know, the client uploads an image. It gets put into an S3 bucket. Uh, the on-created event fires, and there's a Lambda function listening. Um, that Lambda function then uses, this is another uh, AWS service called Recognition for facial recognition. Um, the image gets uh, passed over there, and then it will, <coughs> excuse me, overlay emojis on people's faces. Um, this is a silly example, but uh, you could extrapolate this to, you know, doing things like, you know, making sure pictures are safe for your website or, uh, you know, really, yeah, basically tagging people in photos and social apps. Fun one, but it, it, I like showing this one because it, it shows the event-driven kind of nature of these applications. So one thing happens, and then another thing happens, etc. Uh, here's another example. This is a serverless screenshot service using uh, Lambda, and uh, there's a blog post over on our site if you want to check out exactly how this is done. Uh, the repo is there as well. But basically, this is uh, using um, what I mentioned before, using a binary, uh, PhantomJS, which is a headless browser. Um, if you haven't tried Phantom, it's super cool. Uh, I recommend checking it out. Uh, but basically, uh, you can take screenshots with it uh, and do a bunch of other stuff. But um, this service will uh, listen to um, an incoming request with a URL. It'll then spin up a Lambda function uh, that then, you know, starts up Phantom. Phantom will go, take a screenshot, and then store that uh, into a bucket <clears throat> and create a thumbnail. So there's actually a couple of different functions here composed together. So there's a create function screenshot that then puts it into a bucket. Uh, there's a create thumbnail. So the screenshot might be too big to actually display on the front end of the, the site. So it'll create a thumbnail, put that back in the bucket. Um, and then there's also like a list screenshots function that uh, I guess returns to the user. But a uh, pretty cool project. Um, and yeah. So uh, another use case, this is from our server, or sorry, it's from our website. So our site is 100% uh, serverless, meaning, um, I mean, it's still, <laughs> there's still a server at the end of the day. Um, there always is, but um, 
it's basically a static site built with Phenomic. It's served up from a CDN. Um, so like we kind of get that raw scale out of the box. We don't need to worry about, um, you know, spikes in traffic or anything. Um, it has, it's running React on the front end. That's what Phenomic uses to do the uh, site build. Um, and then some functions that we're using. So we have Lambda functions for processing uh, forms. So if someone fills out our contact us form, um, you know, that'll go through Lambda function and route to the appropriate person. Um, we also have 404 tracking set up uh, through a Lambda function. So if you hit a 404 page, it will uh, hit a Lambda function, store that uh, URL in a DynamoDB table, um, and let me know that basically there's broken links on the site that we need to fix. Um, and then we also have some protected API calls. Um, and, and I'll show you guys that, uh, an example of that in the next slide. Um, and we also, we're working on doing some, uh, serving up some dynamic uh, routes, uh, serving uh, HTML from Lambda functions, um, which should be interesting. So yeah, so basically like all this stuff will scale without like lifting a finger. Um, it just will work. And the greatest part about it is, you know, we only pay for when it's being run. Um, and a side note on that, uh, which I haven't mentioned is like uh, AWS Lambda and all the other providers have a very uh, pretty generous free tier. So I believe it's uh, a million invocations uh, a month for free. So if we were getting, you know, more than a million form requests, then we would pay money for that function, which we don't get right now, <laughs> maybe one day. But uh, you could see how, uh, you know, with that generous free tier, you could build out a lot of uh, standalone applications uh, pretty, pretty easily and pretty cheaply, uh, if not free, uh, with the free tier. So that was also kind of one of the selling points to me um, I can basically set up all of these different side projects um, and different, um, you know, IOT apps that I want around the house without really needing to pay monthly for those boxes anymore. Cool. And this is a, this is a, an example of a protected API route. Um, basically the user logs in via auth zero, uh, it goes in through API gateway. Um, Lambda gives you the ability to set up a custom authorizer function. So like if the JSON web token actually validates, then they can access, um, you know, the uh, authenticated user um, endpoint. If not, they get uh, not authorized response um, back and it tells them to log in or to, you know, upgrade their account or what have you. Um, this is a uh, live demo as well uh, at this URL if you want to check it out. Uh, it's pretty cool. And uh, really using this, so this is using Auth0 for the authentication and, and the JSON web token stuff. Uh, but really, this is kind of what you would need for a you know, SaaS application uh, front end where you, know, you have a homepage maybe, and then you have a login screen, and then you have your actual application that you only want to allow people that you know, pay money to use. Um, that demo will kind of show you how that works. And uh, some additional examples can be found on the uh, github.com slash serverless slash examples. Um, yeah, we have a ton of them. Uh, and there's a ton of them, and we just added some for OpenWhisk as well. So um, for your various use cases out there, you can actually see the uh, code and how to do this. Um, and then as a quick aside, um, finding uh, other examples, if you go into GitHub and search globally for dot serverless and then search for recently updated, you can actually see um, what people are doing, what kind of serverless applications people are building. I do this all the time. It's, it's super interesting to see um, the kind of uh, complex applications people are, are piecing together. Uh, again, taking that microservices approach but um, yeah, so highly recommend checking that out as well. Um, cool. So those are, those are some of the use cases. Let me uh, check the chat. Okay, we'll come back to that.
All right. So who actually uses this though? Like, is it just for, you know, your hobby projects? Is it just for um, things that uh, don't really need to scale, etc.? cetera? The answer is no. Um, some of like the largest Fortune 500 companies are using Lambda in production today. Um, you know, Nordstrom, Coca-Cola, Vivo, Autodesk. I mean, Amazon, of course, is using it because everything that AWS builds uh, is for like to support Amazon.com. Uh, Accenture. I mean, there's a ton, a ton, a ton of very large companies that are leveraging uh, Lambda at scale. Um, and again, um, yeah, it's just uh, they're seeing they're seeing cost uh, benefits from it, uh, and also kind of the uh, more more agility from um, this approach as well. Because if you don't need to wait for DevOps to basically provision a machine for you anymore, um, you know teams can move much faster and uh, be more agile. Um, and this is a shout out. Uh, this slide is from the serverless state of the union address from reInvent, which happened a couple of months ago. Highly recommend checking out that video. Um, really good. It's uh, Tim Wagner, the, the guy in charge of the Lambda team over there. Uh, they talk about some interesting use cases and a lot of the kind of auxiliary services that you can leverage with um, AWS Lambda. Cool. And yeah, these are some more examples. Um, so Servada. Servada is an interesting one. Um, they're a company here in San Francisco. They do um, serve, they survey for ad effectiveness, but they're basically using Lambda to process hundreds of millions of events uh, and uh, actually drop cookies on people's machines to make sure that they're surveying the right people, um, which is interesting. And then uh, another cool one is uh, Netflix. Netflix is using it for parallel processing for encoding media files. So uh, one, of the, one of the cool things that I haven't mentioned yet is, so like the Lambda functions, when, when they fire, uh, you can spin up multiple of the same Lambda function at the same time, which means that you have the ability to do like parallel processing like to infinity. And I'm doing bunny ears there because nothing can go to infinity, but like at a very, very large scale. Um, so what Netflix is doing is that they are taking a video file and uh, taking the frames of that video file, splitting those frames up, and then basically inv invocating um, you know all these lambda functions to shrink them down or uh, what have you, all at the same time, and then putting them back together at the end. So before you know that might have been a really long running process on one machine, um, but yeah, you can basically run things in parallel and do things. Um, super, super quickly. So you can think like kind of batch processing uh, on steroids. Cool. And then, yeah, definitely check out A Cloud Guru. Their entire site as well is um, serverless driven. Um, really cool what they're doing. They're actually leveraging Firebase as well. So um, it's, a, it's a, you know, video tutorial site when a person, uh, when, a, when a trainer uploads a new video, uh, that gets stored into Firebase, and if the if a user is logged in on that on that training page, uh, you know, course, they will like real time see that kind of new file show up, which is interesting. Cool. All right, so that's uh, enough of me chatting. <laughs> uh, let's jump into some demos. So I can show you some uh, real applications built with this. So let me pull this over here. Okay, so this is the serverless uh, status board. It's a project we just released. It's called Scope. Um, and basically what it allows you to do is, um, it's a you know, completely serverless application. What it lets you do is, um, deploy um, uh, a customizable view of your project. 
So this is actually uh, what's happening in the serverless framework right now. Um, this is all event driven. So uh, the issues coming in are mapped to a specific column, which you can customize and what have you. Um, well, let's actually take a look at the back end, how it works. Let me see another chat. Okay. Cool. So it's basically like this is the architecture. So you have a GitHub repo, uh, some activity happens, it triggers a GitHub webhook um, that goes through API gateway to our post endpoint, and then it uh, basically triggers our Lambda that is listening for the event and saves it into DynamoDB. So the code for that um, actually looks like this. So if we go into the webhook listener, you can see that you know, I'm using um, you know, normal uh, NPM modules in this section node um, core one. And it's simply like a function with, that accepts an event, uh, context and callback. And we'll look at a simpler example of this. But this is basically verifying the um, GitHub uh, webhook request to make sure that no one else is hitting it but GitHub. Once it does that, it processes the data and then saves it into the database. So pretty simple code. Uh, very similar that, that, that you would write as, you know, in a standalone node app, uh, except, you know, this is running uh, only when a, a new event or a new comment or a new pull request happens in our GitHub repository. And then that gets uh, tossed back into the status board. So we can see, yeah, and we have the recently completed section here as well. Um, and I can sort this as well to see. So we, we needed this person like for the serverless project because there's a lot of stuff happening in it. Um, and we can kind of sort and see like, okay, what are people really, you know, interested in or what stuff do we want to highlight uh, for our community to jump in and get involved with. So that's kind of one of the reasons we built it. And then uh, I built it so everyone can use it for any GitHub project. Um, but yeah. Cool, so that's, that's uh, one piece of the back end. So that's the GitHub webhook listener. Uh, and then the second piece is just an, a simple API call to uh, the DynamoDB table. So we go through API gateway, uh, it triggers the Lambda function, that Lambda function goes and gets the items out of the DynamoDB table, and then we'll pipe that back to the UI. So really, really simple um, uh, serverless application that again, like we're running uh, for, uh, in, in, under the uh, free tier of AWS. So that is um, the one example. Um, and let's actually look at a demo. So here's, this is actually the, uh, this is the Dynamo table. Um, so let's see it in action. I'm gonna go close an issue on our, uh, <laughs> let's close an issue and then reopen it because it's probably not closed yet. So here's an issue that I made. So there's a vague error in our CLI and I don't like vague errors. So I'm gonna actually close this. And uh, if we come back into Dynamo, what, what's the ID? The ID is 3,221. 3, so that's not on the closed items right now. But if I refresh this, there it is. So you can see that that uh, Lambda function triggered and store the item in the DynamoDB table. And then uh, uh, it, the reverse, so if I reopen the issue because it's not closed, we do need to fix that. Um, it'll actually go ping the Lambda function to remove it and put it back on the open items table. So that's a really simple, uh, useful kind of example of a serverless driven application that like we don't have to set up our own server to run this stuff. Um, this, th that, this will just run forever unless GitHub changes their webhook syntax um, for us and we can just embed it on our site and uh, you know kind of be off to the races. So that is the um, first demo that I wanted to show you guys. Let me go back to my slides. Yeah, I already talked about the API. So let's actually do another demo real quick. Let's do, we'll do a live uh, deployment of a service. 
So hopefully this is big enough. I'm gonna zoom in. Okay, so, um, and again, like you don't need to use the serverless framework to do this. You can wire all this stuff up yourself. Um, it's, it's rather painful to do so in the AWS uh, user interface. So highly recommend uh, npm i serverless dash g. That'll install it globally. Um, but once I have serverless installed, uh, I can basically serve SLS. So there's a bunch of different commands where I can deploy, roll back stuff, and do a bunch of crazy things. But for this demo, I wanted to show you guys basically how to, we're gonna create an infinitely scalable API endpoint right now and deploy it to the internet. Okay, so uh, serverless create, and I'm giving it a template name. So it's gonna be AWS, and the runtime is gonna be Node.js. And then this, the path is just the folder that it's gonna create this service for us in. So let's go ahead and create that. Cool, so that uh, folder is now created. So let's go in there and take a look at the code. Cool, so here is our demo. Um, so as you can see, like the bare bones handler uh, function that we're gonna deploy, super straightforward. I'm gonna comment out this. Um, but yeah, every, every function handler has this uh, event context callback uh, mechanism. And then for a um, serverless service, we have a serverless.yaml file. And what this YAML file does is basically it lets us define what functions we're gonna deploy and what infrastructure requirements we need. So if I needed a um, if I needed a database with this, I could define that here, and it would actually uh, create that for me. This is using uh, CloudFormation under the hood. Um, but right now, this would just deploy a Lambda function that's not exposed to the internet. So what we actually want to do is expose an event. So if I do events, and the event is HTTP. And um, I'm gonna set the path. So we have a API endpoint path, hello, creator. And then I'm just gonna set the method as get. So get post, you know, put delete. We're just gonna do get, cool. So again, this is saying, okay, deploy this to AWS with the runtime of Node.js. My service's name is creator demo. And, oops, hello, <laughs> hell crater. Uh, okay, cool. So that's all done. And now all we need to do is uh, SLS. SLS is shorthand for serverless um, deploy. So what that's gonna do is it's going to go ahead and uh, you know read through my project, see all the functions that I have, um, see what infrastructure requirements I've specified in the uh, serverless.yaml, and uh, go ahead and spin those up. Uh, it does take a minute or two, um, and that's a limitation on AWS's side, uh, creating the IAM roles, the permissions to actually, you know, for us to run this function uh, via API Gateway. So it looks like it's almost done. While it's doing that, uh, I'm gonna jump into the docs real quick and show you guys. So if you go into uh, the documentation um, and go into AWS and look at the events, there's uh, basically all the different events that you can plug into right now. So like I mentioned, S3, a cron job with a schedule event, uh, SNS, uh, you know, setting up your own custom Alexa skill, et cetera. Um, let's see, still creating. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, and all the documentation as well as like the open with stuff is here as well. Um, and then we have some examples, the actual CLI reference. Um, so what we just did is run the deploy command and you can deploy into multiple stages as well. Um, I'm just deploying this into a dev stage right now. But um, yeah, so almost done.
So close. <laughs> I really wish Amazon would do something about this. Uh, it is painful. The, this only happens on the first deploy though, um, because it has to set up all the IM roles. Uh, once your IM roles are set up, uh, deploying it is super quick and easy. Hey, while we're waiting, um, there was one question here. Did I sure. see environment variables in the code? Where do those get set in the system? Will? Uh, very good question. Okay, so let me pop open scope here. So the environment variables are set inside of the serverless.yaml file. So um, here, uh, basically, yeah, under the provider or under the given function, you can set environment variables. This looks a little crazy because it's using our variable syntax because I'm pulling those from a JSON file. But uh, as a simpler example, we'll go in here. So if I wanted to set environment variables, I could just do this. So environment, and then I could set in my tokens or what have you. So. X, Y, Z, uh, yeah. So that's, that's the environment variable. Oh man, it's still going. I did this right before the, the presentation and it went way faster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. All right, the stack is finished, great. The demo gods are with us today. Okay, cool, so what we just did is we deployed our um, service into US East One and it gave me back a live endpoint. So if I actually open up my browser to that um, URL, we can see, boom, there is the returned uh, response. So this, like you could hammer with, you know, a bajillion requests, it'll scale for us. Please don't do that, because <laughs> that's not nice. But um, let me actually show you guys how easy it is to change something as well. So if let's say I wanted to change something, I want to actually change this to like I creator. So all I need to do now is deploy my actual function. So SLS deploy function and then the function name, which is just hello. So that was way faster. And then if I refresh this page, we can see hi creator. So there, there's like our live API endpoint for our, our backend. Um, again, you know, this is super simple code, not using any like third party API calls or anything else or any Amazon uh, infrastructure, but you can kind of get the idea um, of what you could do with that. Or if I wanted to run this on a cron job and send myself a text message or whatever. But yeah, so there's the, the two live demos. Um, I think I just have a couple more slides. So where, where to get started? Where should you get started learning this stuff? So here are some handy links uh, that I recommend checking out. Again, our docs, our examples. Uh, if you wanna see like kind of a full working project with a front end and a back end, check out this serverless slash scope project. Uh, we actually just released that yesterday. Um, that was fun times. Uh, and then, yeah, the serverless repo. And uh, if you want to chat about this stuff as well, we have a really vibrant community. Uh, I, I, there's like a couple thousand people in our Gitter channel. Um, so if you do have serverless questions um, and or you're stuck on something or you're getting a syntax error or what have you, uh, you know, toss uh, a chat into the our Gitter channel or into our forum. Um, and uh, you know, someone will be back with you shortly. Um, that's what, that's one of the, the good things about um, our kind of community. Um, cool. And yeah, check out the docs and all the docs are editable as well. If you see a typo, don't send me an email, just go ahead and edit it. <laughs> Submit your first pull request to the serverless uh, project. Whew, that was a lot. All right, awesome. questions. Yeah, thank you, David. That was that was awesome. Uh, yeah, we have quite a few questions here. Um, I think early on, maybe people weren't understanding. You were mentioning a website for learning serverless. I think maybe you just covered it in one of those last slides, though. 
Yeah, so that's a cloud guru, a cloud dot guru. I believe that's the URL. Okay, perfect. Or just Google a cloud guru serverless, and yeah, you'll find it. Um, really good stuff that they put out. All right, so Ryan, who by the way has an Amazon Echo there, apparently we were you were setting it off during your talk. He said, "Don't say Alexa, turn off the office lights." <laughs> Nice. Just turn off his lights. Um, nice. Yeah, I just got an Alexa. <laughs> it's it's super interesting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so you said you had mentioned that the website, the service website, also um, is completely serverless and it's secured with TLS. How does that work? Uh, if you're just routing to a function, then who handles the TLS? Is there a traditional gateway server between the client and the Lambda functions? I think this is more like you're serving it up from S3, I believe you said. Or yeah, so we're we're using uh, oh. Netlify as our CDN. Um, it's actually so I just posted a link in the chat there. Uh, the the site is totally open source as well if you want to check it out. Um, but yeah, so we pipe that up through Netlify. So I mean, yeah, it is going through you know a DNS and you know look up and blah blah blah, but. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. And, and you'll notice that, yeah, a lot of stuff is happening on the client side as well. So that's the beauty of what we're using. We're using um, Phenomic IO. So it is basically, it'll do the, the React server-side rendering for you at build time. And then that's what actually gets piped up to the CDN. And then when the person actually gets into the website, uh, it, the React router will pick up and then you can just kind of jump around. So if you navigate around the serverless website and you're wondering like, how is this so freaking crazy fast? Uh, that's the answer. Nice. Good answer. Um, yeah, so Violetta asked, can we use serverless for real-time apps? And I've actually seen it done, but I'm curious to hear your answer too. Yeah, so you can use serverless with uh, real-time applications. There is uh, an offering from AWS um, for like socket connections. I believe it's it's through yeah it's through their IoT offering. Uh, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Uh, I haven't personally done anything real-time. Um, I actually thought that was one of the limitations when I uh, first started uh, working with serverless stuff. But uh, yeah, some people are doing it. Or uh, I have seen people uh, using Firebase as well, like a cloud guru to um, you know pipe back data. So when a new thing gets added to, let's say, like a DynamoDB table or to your Firebase, it would pipe back through to um, the front end. But yeah. All right. And Will had another question here. What is your experience with DynamoDB? How does it compare to other NoSQL databases? Um, yeah, so learning Dynamo is a little tricky. Um, it's, I, I, so I've used, I've used Mongo and I've used Dynamo. Uh, Mongo is like much more straightforward, like with their API interacting with it. Yeah. The Dynamo API is a little strange and you really got to get used to it. Um, but what I like about Dynamo over Mongo is that, I mean, it, it, will just kind of scale for me. I don't need to, uh, you know, yeah, basically do worry about any of that stuff, any of the sharding stuff, if you're setting up your table correctly. Um, and it's crazy and expensive. Yeah, and Ryan is saying all the things I should be saying in the chat. <laughs> Freakishly scalable. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people talk about the fact that like the the free tiers that they have for Dynamo and for you know Lambda are they they actually give you quite a lot, so um, it's pretty pretty cheap, almost free for a lot of people to run stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and if you check out um, the Scope project inside of the backend, I actually I wrote a I wrote a Dynamo DB kind of client helper to make it not as bad. Um, it's, yeah, let me, I'll post the link in chat. 
But uh, A-Cloud, so I, I learned a lot of Dynamo DB stuff from actually A-Cloud Guru as well. Like they have a really good, they have a, they have a course that's like 25 hours long. It's crazy. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, I guess I also had a question. Like, do you find, it's almost like um, since you're running functions and they're like kind of, uh, run on the fly. Do you find that uh, there's a problem with like response times being a little bit slower or do they seem just kind of in line with other APIs or what? Yeah. So um, there is, I actually don't really notice it anymore, um, but there used to be what, what are called like cold start times because everything it basically, excuse me, Lambda is running uh, through a container the container has to spin up uh, to like, you know, return your function, run your function. Um, so there were like, and this was a while ago that it was pretty noticeable, like when the function was cold, like it hadn't been run in a certain period of time. So the machine wasn't waiting. Um, but I really don't notice those anymore. And I know Amazon's working like extremely hard to basically eliminate those completely. But uh, nice. yeah. And for most things, so it, the response time, even with cold starts, there's, there's some ways around that. So like if you're doing something in the UI, you know, you can do an optimistic update or set a loading state uh, until something returns instead of, you know, just having the user like click on a button and nothing happened for, you know, and again, the, it, yeah. But yeah, to answer your question, Sometimes there are, but I don't really notice them uh, anymore. Um, especially if you go, yeah, if you go look at the scope, like um, uh, roadmap, like the the status board on our site, it's really just like it's pulling in Dynamo. So if you see there's and there's a loading state, but yeah. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So this is this is loading the data directly from Dynamo. Well, so yeah, so it's it's hitting a Lambda, it's going through API Gateway, running a Lambda function, and then that Lambda function talks to Dynamo, gets all the items back, and returns them to the UI. I see, okay. Yeah. And then, you know, another thing that I've seen interesting too is like, there is like a GraphQL, someone's already made like a GraphQL port to serverless. Yeah, yeah, so we have a, we have a GraphQL project. So instead of um, setting up multiple API endpoints, um, you can just set up one and it's a GraphQL and then you got to train the GraphQL to go and fetch the data from all the different places. But yeah, that's totally doable. And one of the patterns that we're seeing kind of merging. Yeah. I would think like this is, this is a perfect use case for that. I would think. Yeah. Cause then you never have to like change the URLs in the front end code, which right. is annoying. You just kind of ask for the data you want and, and your resolvers know how to get it. Yeah. Um, can you talk maybe just a little bit more about the authentication stuff? Uh, is Auth0 kind of the, the preferred way or are there other ways to handle authentication? Um, kind of curious in that myself. Yeah, sure. So let's see. So I like, we just use Auth0 because like it's super, super easy to integrate. Like I dropped it in our site and like literally, I don't know, probably took 20 minutes. Um, if you click on join beta on our site, you can see it like kind of in action, but, uh, basically you can use, um, Amazon has an authentication provider called, uh, Cognito, which you can plug into all the different social applications as well. Um, but really what you'd want to do for authenticated routes is, um, set up a, an authorizer function. Let me actually send you guys a link of exactly what that looks like. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here it is. So it's basically like if the uh, JSON web token sent in the header is incorrect, it will just throw back an error like, hey, you're not authorized. If, it, if they are authorized, it'll keep passing it it'll pass it through to do whatever Lambda function it was trying to do. And, and the interesting thing about that is like the authorizers like cache as well. So it doesn't have to like run every time. It like kind of caches in front of your, your API gateway layer. Okay. But yeah. 
Yeah, so really, like at this point, you could do anything you wanted. You wouldn't have to rely on all zero. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't have to at all. Yeah, you could roll your own. We just use that because it's, yeah, it was just super easy to integrate with. Um, I think like once you start getting like a ton of active monthly users, all zero, I think starts becoming expensive. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we might actually change that at, at one day, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, well, I mean, you know, uh, you have options there as well with Passport, obviously doing JWT and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you could use Passport in the Lambda function as well if you wanted as your authorizer. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I think uh, that was all the questions I had, all the questions the audience had. I just want to say thank you, David. This was uh, pretty awesome. And I appreciate you coming and chatting with us and showing us all this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's, it's always fun to chat about this stuff. If you guys have any other like questions about serverless stuff, feel free to uh, tweet at me at David Wells. Uh, always happy to help. This video has been a Space Dojo production. You can click the learn more button to find out more about us at spacedojo.com. Or you can click the subscribe button to get notified about new videos we put out each week. Thanks for watching.